Back on the program is former Ohio Republic Republican Congressman Bob Ney. He represented Ohio's 18th congressional district from 1995 until November of 2006, when he resigned after pleading guilty to charges of conspiracy and making false statements in relation to the Jack Abramoff Indian lobbying scandal. He spent 17 months in prison. Bob is also the author of the book Sideswiped Lessons Learned Courtesy of the Hitmen of Capitol Hill, which we've talked about extensively on the show. It's great as always to have you. I'm going to open up with a broad question, which is in watching Republicans handle the shutdown the way that they did and Obamacare the way that they are, do you think that this is good or bad political strategy long term? Oh, it's bad long term. It might have had some short term gain. Of course, the shutdown didn't have any type of short-term gain either because what Speaker John Boehner did in the 16th day of the whole fiasco he could have done in the first day, which was to throw something out for a vote, both parties vote for it, and the government remains open. But the long-term strategy is actually very bad for the Republican Party. And if you go back to the Newt Gingrich days when they had the government shut down, it was over a big-picture uh, issue, which was the, you know, the generic way that the budget was handled, the future mortgaging of, uh, of people's uh, livelihoods and futures, you know, the whole line that was given at that time. But in this case, it was a specific narrow issue of shutting the government down over one thing, Obamacare. So not only did the Republicans lose the big picture, Senator Cruz got stiffed by his own party because Mitch McConnell and Republicans gave Harry Reid, the Democratic leader, the ability to, to bring the cloture vote, which allowed a vote to remove what the House had done with Obamacare. So they lost all the way around. Look, there's a hundred ways to skin a cat. I was in Congress. They could do it a hundred different ways through the appropriations process if they don't like Obamacare. They totally lost sight, David, of the big picture and went after one specific item, which might have had a short-term gain making the Tea Party happy, but it hurt them in the long run. So you, you, as well as anyone else, knows the inner workings of what goes on behind the scenes when thinking about whether to oppose here or accept there. I am assuming, and correct me if I'm wrong, that it wasn't completely unpredictable the way that the public reacted to the shutdown, or, or was it? I mean, it seems so hard for me to believe that it came as a total surprise to Republican leadership, including John Boehner, but at the same time, if they had known this is the way it would work out, it's hard to imagine they would choose this. Well, this was not originally, I think, the intention. I think in Speaker John Boehner's mind, you know, he was going to give some lip service. He was going to let him rattle the swords. Cruz was doing his deal in the Senate, Senator Cruz. But I don't think that, that John Boehner was going to head towards an actual shutdown. I think he gave lip service to 30 or 40 members in his own caucus. But at the end of the day, John Boehner's leadership is so weak. I mean, the worst place to have an accident is in the middle of the road. That's where he tried to maneuver himself, giving lip service to the right and to the moderates in his caucus. And I think uh, then his staff realized he either had to go along with this and institute a shutdown, or there was going to be about 40 votes maybe calling for a new speaker's election a little bit quicker than John Boehner wanted. So I think it, it did come as a, a shock. I don't think it was his original game plan. Then, of course, he does it for 16 days and reopens the government, which he could have done 16 days earlier. I've been talking for a little while about what I kind of see as the three uh, branches of the modern Republican Party. And you have kind of like the Tea Party, small government uh, low uh, uh, side, which is not particularly religious, although some elements are. You have the religious evangelical branch of the Republican Party. And then you have those most in line with like a Mitt Romney, for example, who are more the pro business, keep taxes low branch. Do you think that that is an accurate depiction of the Republican Party, bearing in mind that there is some overlap or or, or do you see it a little differently? No, I, I think it's an accurate uh, description of the Republican Party as it exists today. Some of people will overlap, but I think it's a pretty accurate description. OK, so is there one particular group there that you think is doing the most damage to the chances of Republicans in 2014 and 2016. And if you had to pick one of those groups, which probably has the best chat chance at having the broadest appeal? Well, the problem is with the with the damage section is the Tea Party. And now, first of all, the Tea Party was a strong group and anybody that underestimated it, you know, 
saw what, what they could do. But now the Tea Party is venturing into primaries against Republicans. Mm. At the end of the day, David, that's when this will all cut loose because the Republican structure is not going to tolerate going after their own. Or if they do, then they're not going to have much left where you would have maybe 50 or 60 people in a minority who win one once in a while and they are purists. Or does the Republican Party want to have the control of the House, the Senate, maybe the White House, and not be, quote, so pure as to follow what 45 people in that House caucus believe? So the Tea Party, if, if John Boehner continues to do what he's done as Speaker, because you know, Mitch McConnell's not head of the, of the Senate, he's a Republican minority leader over there, but if Boehner continues to do this, uh, he's not going to win at the end of the day to keep his speakership anyway, but uh, but he will have fractionalized the caucus so much it can't survive. So the group that's going to survive, I think, is going to be the group of that, uh, and, and it's like the dirty word of moderates, but it's the group that will be, you know, they're fairly conservative on fiscal side, but they'll be basically moderates, and they are also going to be people that are willing to, to reach across the aisle once in a while. It's not a dirty word to, to uh, have an interaction with the other party you know, to secure some votes in a lot of cases. We did it with the Help America Vote Act with Teddy Hoyer. There's plenty of precedent, even under Newt Gingrich and Bill Clinton, to get some things done. All right, so last thing, aside from moderates, broadly speaking, being having the best chance for the Republican Party in the next couple of elections, if right now you were advising the Republican Party on specific issues, is there a particular issue you think Republicans should drop for their advantage? And is there a particular issue you think they should focus on? Well, they, they should uh, drop the uh, opposition to immigration reform. That's the issue where they should take a cue, especially for maybe from uh, Senator Rubio, who's a you know Latino background, take a cue from that. And on that one, make something happen. People who are here, make something happen. Uh, on the one issue that they can do something about, and they will gain a lot, I think, of support, is the fiscal issue. But not just taking away a safety net. They have to be understanding there are people that are in need and they need that safety net. But to do this in a very balanced way, to get a handle on the budget, that should be their mantra. And if they do that, the moderates will work with the conservatives. And that's the point I guess I, I wanted to make. The moderates will accept people of, to the right and to the left. The one thing the Republican Party also wants to avoid is since when is it always a litmus test that you want to be Dick Cheney and go to war? The mm. Republicans have to go to war. So I think they need to, to you know, compromise on the immigration issue, stay away from uh, being bloodthirsty on wanting to constantly get, engage in a, in a war somewhere. Can Republicans not get away from issues like marriage equality and abortion, which for the first time in history both have overwhelming support from Americans because they depend on those to fundraise in key areas? Well, I think the big point of the Republican Party that it needs to cure itself on is this. You know, if you if you want to come into the Republican Party, it has to be a big tent. Some will be to the left, to the right, and some in the middle. But the party tends to want to everybody to be a, a purist, like Lemmings, Lemmings, and and that can't happen. So they need to open that that broad tent up. As far as the is the uh, gay marriage, the Supreme Court has spoken. I think they're actually you're seeing them let that that uh, issue go in itself. Hmm. The abortion issue, there'll be people pro-choice, uh, pro, uh, you know pro-life, uh, and they can all be a part of the party. I think the big thing is Republicans need to not put people on probation for their views and then throw them out of the party if they don't like them. All right. Former Ohio Republican Congressman Bob Ney. The book is Sideswiped, Lessons Learned, courtesy of the Hitmen of Capitol Hill. Really great as always to talk to you. Thank you, David.